All right, we are live, gentlemen. Good afternoon, all. Today is $10,000 Thursday, like it has been for the last 23 weeks. Welcome to our weekly Rockwall Veterans Business Alliance uh, weekly kickoff. This uh, week, we're going to start it off with our series that we talked about last week, which is about level five. Right, we are live, gentlemen. Welcome and to our got a little feedback, but nonetheless, uh, we have our commander for our American Legion, Terry Fisher, 117 post, Mr. Mark Kippa with us. As always, Dagon Doc Brannigan. And then Casey Ashmore has his invisible suits on, but he'll be right back here in just a minute. So, All right. What's going on, peeps? Hope you guys had a very successful week in growing your business, overcoming any obstacles and hurdles. And just like Jeff said, $10,000 to Thursday coming at you. I don't want to go backwards. We want to keep going forward. We look forward to an excellent uh, show this evening with, with Mark. And uh, here he is, Honorable Casey Ashmore. How you doing, there sir? He is. Doing great, guys. Thank you all. All right, so let's kick this off real quick. We're going to first and foremost start out with our uh, member spotlight of the week. And I'd like to bring to attention our member spotlight is AMCAP uh, Home Loans, Mr. William Branch. And we'll put all the details in, in the Facebook uh, post here and in that. But William Branch uh, leads a lending uh, company here locally in Rockwall. He's the branch manager there, the owner. Fantastic guy. He's a great friend of mine. He's a client of mine. And he also just helped me personally refinance my home. So, you know, he's not a veteran, but he's an RVBA member. And that just lets you know that we do business with one another and we expand and we hang with winners, right? So if you guys are looking to refinance your, your home loans or whatever type of loans are out there, William Branch is the guy. I'm telling you, I, I'm a straight shooter. You guys know that, but the process was seamless from start to finish. So there's a little pitch. I'll put some notes in there. Um, we want to introduce Mr. Colonel Mark Kippett, retired Air Force, uh, extremely successful man, uh, born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He has a, a BA, he has an MA, all kinds of acronyms and stuff from colleges and school of higher power. I mean, the dude is an amazing guy here. So not only is he a great guy, but he has a lot of experience. And that's why he's starting us off tonight with our level five leadership. He served for 30 years in the Air Force from Desert Shield, the Enduring Freedom and all kinds of uh, tactical missions and, and strategic planning in a leadership position throughout the military. Uh, worked for Raytheon for eight years and was responsible for $300 million in annual sales. Let me say that again. $300 million. He was a leader in that position. That is exactly why tonight he's going to kick us off. So, Mr. Kippett, thank you so much for joining us. The floor is yours, my friend. All right. Well, it's great to be here. So, first, I wore my red shirt to honor the Marines. I wore my blue underwear to honor the Navy. <laughs> I've got my Air Force hat on. And I've got an extra 25 pounds for the Coast Guard. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. He's coming in hot tonight, folks. So, we're, so it's it's a great opportunity to, to talk uh, and share a little of my background, share a little of my experience, and and an honor to be with RVBA. I can't can't say enough for what the RVBA is doing for veterans in Rockwall. Uh, from a cold start a couple of years ago, you guys are hitting it and hitting it hard, and I appreciate it. For William Branch, I'll just say, I'll add, he's a patriot. He comes from a committed family here in Rockwall, and he is out to help veterans, and he has done a great job. Uh, he's I've done multiple uh, mortgages through him. So uh, always fair, always ethical, and uh, make sure you get the right deal. Uh, and, and he's focused on, what I like about him is he's focused on making sure you have an affordable solution not just a solution. Absolutely. So he's looking out for your finances. So, um, so tonight, when we get started, it, you know, this, I, I know you, it, we talked about good to great, and it's not a book review, and I, I 100% agree with that. So, what I want to do is, from a business perspective, talk about this book and how it impacted my life uh, and my life and business, especially and a little bit um, about why it's relevant. So I went back and I pulled out a presentation I did back in 2005 to a group of senior officers uh, prior to my retirement from the Air Force. And I had a Harris poll 
that said it, it addressed business and employees in, and this is in 2005. And I'm just going to read a couple stats here because I think it gets the gets to the point. Only 37% had a clear understanding of what their business goals were. Only one in five workers were enthusiastic about the uh, team that they were on. And only one in five understood a clear line of sight between the tasks they were doing and what the business goals were. And when you look at those kinds of numbers, you see that's why there's a lot of unhappy people that work in businesses. They're just right. It's it's the they're going to the they're going to the mine every day to dig out salt. And uh, what good to great does is it talks about building great greatness in companies, but really about how you build greatness in teams yeah. that can execute. So really when I'm I'm going to throw a couple questions more. out here for you guys first, and then I'll let you come back. So here's some here's some strategic assumptions that businesses have. Our customers will continue to value our premium price innovations. Our brand has power; it protects us from our competitors, and our quality enables us to sustain a price position in the market that are good enough but not the best what do you guys think about those kinds of statements hit us with the first one one more time um our our customers are willing to pay higher prices for our great service Casey, take that one brother that's if that existed it's gone and with the rarest exception, some some major brands might might be able to continue that attitude. Mercedes Benz, for example, is a company that has I, I never owned one. They got a reputation as a company that people come to and will pay whatever the price is because it's a Mercedes Benz. Lexus took that on Toyota, right? Toyota owned 0% of the market share. They spent $1 billion to build a car that could challenge Mercedes in North America. And wow. they're kicking Mercedes ass, right? And they're doing it because they attacked that, that mindset that a customer will pay anything because it's the brand. And I'm not picking on Mercedes. They do make an amazing product, but are, are they as competitive? You know, Toyota's working 10 times harder to get that dollar for that luxury market, right? They're working 10 times. They spent a billion dollars on a car that they hoped would, would be something that would catch on in America, and it did. It set the world on fire, changed, yeah. the, changed the standard of the luxury automobile industry and customer service and maintenance and repair. And, you know, that kind of explains why 80% of everything Toyota's ever made, including Lexus, is still on the road. So I think that that is a very dangerous mindset, especially if you're the up and comer, if you're the little guy, if you're if you're Hershey's chocolate and that's maybe you can, you know, you can float on the, you know, the Hershey kiss and the chocolate bar. And, you know, you know, you're going to have sales every Valentine's Day and you know, you're going to have Christmas sales, you know, sure. But if you're not making Hershey bars, you better be working. You better be hustling harder because I think that is a very short sighted way to, and again, that's one of the things this book really stressed. That's something I took away from it, Mark, is that you really have to hustle harder and give your customer, you can't always do this, but you hope to do this, that even if it costs 10 times as much, they still would have felt like it was an exceptional value. Right. Well, hit us with that second one, Mr. Kippett. Hey. Let me see. Our brand has power. It protects us from new competitors. Hit that, Doc. What do you think? Um, I'm I'm 100 on board with that. Uh, one of my companies, USA Mobile Drug Testing, of USA Mobile Drug Testing. That brand right there is powerful, right? It tells you who we are. We are a mobile drug testing company, and we cover the USA, right? So it's letting anybody out there know that we can take care of them on a national level right 
And if somebody comes back in and tries to open up some sort of a mobile uh, testing facility, I already have the, the baddest name out there. You can only come up with mobile drug testing, right? You can't have that powerful USA brand in front of it. Yeah. Well, I, I agree 100% with that. And I also want to piggyback on a little bit about customers will pay higher prices for a better service. And I'm going to tap right into this USA mobile drug testing thing. Um, whenever some a company has an accident on site, they do not want to take that employee and take them somewhere. They need somebody that will come to their facility. Right so then, they right pay now. me a premium. Yeah. They pay a cost. They pay me 150 bucks an hour to come out there. I got my person driving to Cleburne, Texas right now at that rate because of the service. They called me, I dispatch, and they're on the way Yeah. Right? because they got to have it now. So in some instances, customers will pay that higher price point because of the service I'm providing them, 24-7 support to ensure that their, uh, their insurance is going to be protected, that their workers' compensation is going to be protected, that their, their product and service is going to be protected, and they're protecting their employee as well. So I, 100%, your brand is everything. You take a look at um, Nike, just do it right? You're not going to be able to come in and no other shoe company is able to have done what Nike has done. Or you look at the Air Jordans. They had to piggyback off Michael Jordan to make those shoes. But that is one powerful brand that will last, last generations from, from now. Well, there's something to be said about a brand that doesn't have to use any alphabet. Yeah. It's just a symbol, you know, yeah. the swoosh, the Jordan, whatever. So agree there. Uh, what, what was that third one you had, Mark? Uh, last one was our quality enables us to sustain a price position in a market where good enough, but not the best. Quality helps us sustain. A so price. You, you can, you have uh, a price, your price is good enough, right? But it's yeah. not the best price. So you're, so okay. you're uh, higher at a higher price point than, than some of your peer competitors. I can speak and you're, on that one. And you're, you're there, you assume they're going to pay the premium. I, I can speak on that one because I, I pride myself on not being the Joe in the truck, you know, and not being the higher competitors that I have. I'm in, I'm in that medium ground with my my business as well. And, you know, I let my clients know I'm transparent about that. I'm not the cheap guy, but I'm definitely not over here, you know, up top with, you know, these crazy, crazy expensive prices. So I, I think that I am in that pocket. And I think that my quality supersedes my pricing. So it allows me to do a good job for that client, knowing that they're paying a little bit more on top of that. But then the quality, which supersedes the price, turns into more clients because of the referrals. So okay. th that's how, how I can combat it. All right. So I, I think what so what the, the, the purpose of this book, I mean, what the, what Collins tried to do here. He's trying to understand and explain why some companies are better and more enduring than others and are more importantly able to uh, position themselves where they, you know, they're for a reason. They were for 10 years, they were going bumping along just an average company and then all of a sudden took off like a rocket and okay. sustained that for 15 years. Right. So the question was, why? Why did that happen? And they went through a lot of data reduction to get down to the 11 companies that they wanted to study, which was an important right to get that mix. And then through disciplined, detailed analysis, walked away with right their big five takeaways that they kept, they had out of that, right? That celebrity executives almost never lead good companies to greatness, right? It, it's actually a, what they he terms a level five leader. We're going to talk more about that tonight. Okay. That you can, you can achieve great things without great people. That strategy without people is hollow. That simplicity is important. You have to know your organization and that the simplicity of a clearly uh, trans, a, a strategy that everybody's able to rally around and understands from the from the lowest level worker in the company all the way up through the CEO. And then 
understanding within that simplicity what drives your economic engine. What is the the determinant that is going to per continue to propel your profits? Because I want to come back to the importance of that point. You know, enterprise level this wide discipline is essential. And it must be a culture of discipline that has ethical innovation behind it. And then the proper role for technology, right? So that's the five big takeaways. Okay. But the important thing that I think that he he why it's important to think about these companies is I wanna I want to talk about another aspect of business, and that's called stalls. A stall, stall point, right? Like think of an airplane. You got it, you're you're flying your airplane along yeah. and you run out of airspeed, you stall, you go to the ground. Yeah. So, well, in businesses, there's another detailed study that was looked at. And in when a business went through an extended period of stall, meaning a reduction in revenue, that 76 of them never recover 76% never recovered. Wow. A, 11% were able wow. to restart some growth and only 13% were able to completely recover. So once you experience that loss in revenue, that that from a business perspective and your revenue is not growing and it's decreasing, that inevitably or what history tells us is that bad things happen to that company when that, hap when that takes place. So what Collins is really talking about is the reverse of that. Yeah. The things that keep growth going. And that's why, you know, that's that's the important those important points he did as he took away from this. So and I and I experienced this. So I I'm gonna tell you a little professional story. So there I am, a um, doing pretty well in Raytheon. I'm a director out in Tucson, Arizona, I'm running the IRAD, I'm, I'm doing the business strategy for, uh, for, for Raytheon Missile Systems. And I got asked to take a job here in Garland, Texas, to take over a product line that was the tactical intelligence systems business round, around something that I had done in the military. So of course, my ego thinks, oh, I understand this. This is what I did when I was in the military, so it shouldn't be that hard. Mm -hmm. And my boss out in Tucson, the VP I worked for, said, take a look at their business financials and make sure you understand them. Let's just say I didn't pay as much attention to that advice as I needed to. <laughs> I come rolling out here, and they're writing a billion-dollar contract for Air Force DCGS, Distributed Common Ground System, which now is a joint service system. But the point being, the customer was unhappy. And all of those things I talked about were things that they made assumed worked in that business. That the customer was, because of the innovation, customer was willing to pay more premium because of the high quality service that they offered that the customer was willing to pay premium, that the brand Raytheon would carry the day. And ultimately, what was happening was our revenue was decreasing. So that 300 million started to erode away and the company was had a difficult time, company senior leadership had a difficult time doing the things necessary to reverse that trend. So today, that uh, three it was start that three hundred million dollar business on annual revenue now is probably about call it about uh, 60, 70 million at best for Raytheon. That's a big difference. That's a huge difference, and more importantly, from a customer perspective, they're turning to Lockheed and other peer competitors to provide that same system, that same capability. So even big companies are not immune. So it's important not to, I think it's important not to let your uh, 
assumptions about what you think your business is capable of doing talk you into um, believing something that doesn't exist, right? So yeah. in Colin's book, as they go through and detail all the understanding that they capture from all these various companies. And these are big, big name companies, companies we write, we can, we can talk about the list of them and everybody's going to, you know, pretty much know what they are, but also some of those companies don't exist anymore. So right? we, we talked last week about ask, uh, you know, running head on to the tough questions. Remember doc, we were talking, maybe right. it's two weeks ago. Uh, I think what you're hitting on a point here that's that I'm capturing is that, in your business, you have to face those tough questions again to reiterate that fact. I mean, the numbers you're just telling us right now are, are, are jaw dropping compared to, you know, 76 percent of businesses that lose revenue don't make it back. That's huge. And, and I think that's that's it's an, it's most important when you look at this good to great companies. I mean, when this book was written yeah. in 2001, we'd go, hey, these are all good, really great companies. They, they've done that transfer. Uh, transform but then they didn't sustain that if you look at it now in hindsight 2020 looking back you know where is circuit city yeah. Wells fargo yeah i mean there's one, where's right? Wells, Wells fargo, fargo right Rock and by those are you know um examples of where they didn't sustain their greatness and i think a lot of that right we we want to say Level five leadership is an important aspect, but it's it's a um, it's a necessity that you have to have good leadership. But the leadership itself isn't the only discriminator that's going to drive you forward. It's all yeah, the other I, stuff. So I like how you had said earlier the the um, what was it? I I, I can't say it verbatim, verbatim but. Just because you're a good leader doesn't mean you have a good company or vice versa, something along those lines. That's right. Um, that, that's that's pretty solid advice. I mean, we, we, we harp on leadership a lot, but I think what we're trying to capture here in this series that we're going to be talking about is how we can help you with the information and the guest speakers that we have to help you take your business to the next level, to not be stagnant, to not sit there and just wait for things. Like Casey said, you know, having great service and quality is awesome. Having a good price is awesome, but be the hardest worker in the room every single time. And we're, we're advocates for that every time. And that's we, uh, to a quick question. So you sure. said out of those 76%, 11% of those companies maintained and became even more successful. They got some Sorry. growth. Yeah, they had, restarted. They had, 11% they restarted, restarted and they had growth. What do you think that those 11% of those companies had that that 76 didn't have yeah like, what was that secret sauce that said you know what i'm gonna I, no matter how bad it is right now i'm gonna keep grinding i'm gonna right. keep going i'm gonna keep going was it intestinal fortitude was it a redesign of their whole thing did they diversify and rechannel a whole new product to to increase new revenue because i know back in march when things hit the fan and my company took a hit i had to and i was losing money I had to go and refocus on a different product that I could offer my clients in order for me not to buckle and fail. Is that what these 11% companies did? Or? I think what they, and, and with, so in the case of those companies, they, what they did was what Collins talks about these companies did in their, the 11 good to great companies did, which is they can, conf they confronted their brutal, their brutal facts. They confronted the situation they were in. They understood their environment because in the, if you look at stall points, right, there's from a business perspective, there's two things that impact you every day in your business control, what I'll call controllable factors and what I'll call uncontrollable factors. So the uncontrollable factors are things like, um, labor, the labor market, yeah. geopolitical stuff, right? Regulatory stuff, right? Doc, you could, you're running a, a testing business. You're very susceptible to government regulation that could change overnight. And yeah. you, you probably won't have a lot of say in that. So those, but those are actually a, a smaller, that's why people will often point to business failures, will point to that uncontrollable 
environment. Hey, COVID hit, and I, you know, I, I just couldn't, I couldn't, you know, it wasn't, it was COVID, bad COVID. So they were looking for an excuse. Maybe they were already right, exactly what they, what they, they weren't. What they weren't doing was looking at the reality of the situation and understanding how they had, like you did, how you had to adapt. And that that's that takes fortitude because you know when you get the level five leadership, forget the soft stuff of the of the leadership aspect. What I'm really impressed with is they were able to shed off things that um, you would think they would it would be very hard for him to do, right? The, the um, you look yeah. at a guy like uh, Charles Cork at Walgreen, right? Charles Cork Walgreen. He's, Great example. He's, he's a legacy guy, right? He, he, he's the family, it's a family business essentially. And Walgreen at that time had a big restaurant business, huge restaurant business, and it was profitable. It was but the most profitable. He changed the structure of the company because it was in, he understood the future of what was going to take place. And if he was going to be competitive, most competitive as a in the uh, as a drugstore, national drugstore chain, there are certain things they had to do. And one of the things they did was looked at how do I how do I be most profitable per customer visit, right? On the food side, margins are so slim, you're not going to get a lot of, you have to get a lot of customers to make money in the food business. And, and just put you to um, uh, millennials in the time machine. That was back when you went to a drugstore and you ate lunch there right. or breakfast. And the only place you can see that is the old Highland Park pharmacy in uh, uptown Dallas, but that was literally their biggest piece of their business. Over 30 something percent of their business was food, was food service. Wow. You know, oh, the yeah. soda fountain, you know, the ice cream sundaes. I mean, that's, that's where you went. That, that was before Baskin and Robbins and all these, you know, marble slab cream. You went down to the drugstore to get your prescriptions and take the kids for an ice cream soda. And, and that was something that he looked at, and decided to eliminate, even though it, it it seemed like insanity, right? But what it did was is uh, put them on a course where, in a lot of ways, they mirrored lessons that they had learned from the success of other industry giants. Mm -hmm. Let's find desirable corners where there are going to be developing neighborhoods. You're going to put a grocery store. I mean, why, why do you think there's a Walgreens next to almost every grocery store in Rockwall County, Hunt County, Kaufman County? You just pick a suburb, go find the grocery store within a block or so is the Walgreens. And that was kind of the business model. And they got rid of food service and, and decided to do that. And and then, of course, making it convenient, right? The most profitability per customer well, that was their business. I mean, that's what's going to drive their economic engine was their profitability and and profitability per visit. Another example, right, that was well written out in the book, right? Darwin Smith at Kimberly Clark, a company that was made paper, processed paper, right? That's what they did. <laughs> yeah. Um, and he redirected the company to move out of that into paper-based consumer product. And that paper-based consumer product, things like Huggies, et cetera, right? Scott pay, you know, what they eventually bought their competitor with Scott, you know, they're, yeah, they're yeah. so they moved into, they moved into taking on Procter and Gamble, which was the 800 pound gorilla in the room. And, he's able through to, to change. So that, so that really gets to what Collins talks about is the big, hairy, audacious goal. Every business, right, should have that big, hairy, audacious goal. And it's not one for hubris. It's not a, it's not a goal from bravado. It's a goal that's logically thought through, but is linked. And I'll give you another good example. Okay. Um, at Boeing Aircraft, 
right? They came out of the war, World War II. They had zero position in commercial aircraft. And Ken Miller um, leading the company, they obviously had a solid big time military uh, program with the in heavy bombers. What they did was they looked at their company strategy and then, and as you're going to talk about the hedgehog concept, right? The three circles where they understood what they could be world class at, right? Where their core competencies were, right? Understood how to bring that together. Commercial aircraft were going to be new. So they took, they were able, they saw the future and able to have the courage to take 25% of their value of the company and turn it to build the 707, the Boeing 707. And that transformed Boeing into a commercial airline business. They took a so quarter. That took, of that took big kahunas, right? I mean, let's yeah. face it. You're, well, you're the- you know, to make that kind of bet, but you, the, so, so the level five leader isn't the guy like Leah. It's not Lee Iacocca, right? It's not the egotist. It's the quiet, yeah, um, man. unassuming guy, a lot of humility, but driven and disciplined and relying on the team to, to make sure you understand what you're, a, what you're able to do to really be world class, best in the world. What, can, what do you do? And it's not necessarily a thing you're doing at the time, right, Doc? You got to a good roofing business going right now. Um, but it's a highly competitive environment, very competitive. So you have to either figure out how, you know, unless you're going to just be one of the guys being drug along, how do how do you distinguish yourself in that very highly competitive market? I'm glad you asked Mark, because I currently take 25% of our profits stored away and we have some really big things coming inside of the a lot of the members with inside the RVBA to help distinguish who we are because there are a lot of competitive uh, trades out there. AC, electrical, audio, video, um, roofing. You know what I mean? We are. If you're in a trade, it is a competitive industry. So you make perfect yeah. sense when we say, "How are we going to distinguish ourselves from the the others?" Mm-hmm. Right. By doing that, you hit the nail on the head as I take 25% of profit, I shove it to the side, and I begin to create a whole new idea and concept and run with it so that we can be just a little bit more unique than the next people. Well, And, and that's great because as you get to a point in a business and in the contrast of Doc's Residential Roofing and say Black Level AV, you're ahead of me by years which means you have the experience, the revenue, the generated income. What about a business like myself, Mark, in your opinion, you know, year three, year four, year five, where it's real difficult to take 25% and invest it into something else. I know it takes balls to do that. I mean, just the numbers, what you were talking about, 25% of any company's worth, whether it's Casey's or mine or, you know, pool companies, that's a significant, that's almost a crippling amount if it goes right. wrong i don't i i think that that's an example right there's no template that says yeah. if here's my checklist and follow this what mm-hmm. what it's saying is how do i plan for my future yeah and while 25 percent is beyond what you can do you know it's what you learn again what what collins is telling telling the story of is leaders in 11 companies that were able to bring together and you're going to as you get further into this series you're going to talk about the individual pieces of that but he brings together those uh conceptually under that those individual leaders that are able to start to build a company strategy that envisions the future and they don't put them they the leaders, the level five leaders, don't put themselves. They're not doing it for their benefit. They're doing it for the company's benefit. They're doing it because they want to. Um, you know, a great a great quote from uh, Darwin Smith when he was interviewed. He never felt 
he what he didn't feel like he should have been the CEO when he was chosen by the board. So he never stopped trying to qualify for the job, right? He every day he was trying to win the confidence of his team. And and he wasn't he didn't he didn't command. He he brought people together and uh, achieved great things. You know, right? So thing right there. I don't mean to cut you off, but you No, that's all right. You talk about think and grow rich. That that same concept, continuing to push, continuing to push, right? We talked about it when we do our our, our weekend little, you know, book talk with Doc kind of thing. But that that's a significant point there. If you're watching this video or you're rewatching it later on, you don't have to be the loudest person in the room. You just have to be consistent. That that's what I take away from that. Well, is that a fair statement? Yeah, I think so. I think he set they set uh, standards. They know what they're measuring, right? Yeah. What runs the business and and know what to measure right what in that business um the, and i saw this in raytheon as an example where where it got to be they measured every program the same way and every pro so it yeah. so i used to joke that i i could have a two million dollar contract and i could have a 35 million dollar contract and i had to put as much energy in defeating the machine for the $2 million contract, the company, than as I did for the $35 million contract. Well, obviously, my my profit margins and my my overhead in a $2 million contract don't sustain much lower. Yeah, that kind of reporting up channel. Mm -hmm. You know, that's something so so you always, you know, so naturally they're always trying to run around. We, we used to explain it, you know, going to kill elephants, look for the big contracts when in when all they had to do is change some of their business process for reporting. And and you could you could cobble together a, a large number of smaller contracts okay, and have the same impact. So it was that internal mechanism. And I think you see that in when Collins talks about those leaders, they that they're willing to while they're willing to risk it all and while they have big, hairy, audacious goals, at the same time, they're and they're disciplined, they know exactly what they're going to measure. What what is going to distinguish their company and what do they measure in that? And I love that. I, I love that. Yeah, I, I think I think because I gave this a lot of thought. I mean, there, there's a question, right? Because this is this network is more about smaller entrepreneurial companies than it is about. You don't um, think Raytheon's listening? Yeah, yeah Raytheon's <laughs> not listening. And that's why I'm not with them anymore. You so, know why? Because uh, they've lost so much <laughs> damn money. So the, so the point being, though, but think about this. And so I'm going to give you two points here. First, Sam Walton. Love that, right? Guy. Walmart. Yeah, change the world. Nineteen forty-five, one store, one. Yeah. Um, he uh, store number two didn't come for seven years, wow. so it's now in the fifties. He's then builds, and so from nineteen forty-five. To 19, uh, do my math in my head, 1970, he built a grand total of uh, 25 stores. And then the 70s hit. Yeah. And boom, takes off. And now there's 3,000, right over 3,000 Walmarts. And he did that because he was an entrepreneur, but the processes he used then were the same ones that he used later to run his company. They and just scale whole, up. They scale up. And his whole goal was to make as much profit on on the product. If I remember when I was researching, I, I, I think I, I might say that a little differently because I'm a I yeah. I believe Wal I know a lot Walmart gets because they're so big they get a lot of critics. But Sam Walton, what he wanted to do was he or he wanted to bring to the average american consumer that which the rich had the value exactly yeah and and the so you know a, a toaster oven a a, a uh, you know those kind of basic clothing 
Those yeah. were the things. I mean, at the time in the 40s, especially in Arkansas, you know, I mean, you know, there weren't a lot of choices. So the point being, he's that was his vision. That's what drove him. That's what his passion was to do that. And obviously, he figured out how to do it through supply chain to reduce the price to make it affordable. Mm -hmm. Right. And then that's the I mean, the thing that drove Walmart so well is that global supply chain. Yeah. Where they're able to manage their prices. So so I think the lessons in this book work for a small entrepreneur or for a big business. Right. You just have to have an open mind and be thinking about it. But I'm going to I really go back to the level five leadership because that's where it starts, you know, is is. Um, the great expression that was used in this by, uh, you know, when when Walgreen, Cork Walgreen summed it up, there are show horses and plow horses. Right. Yeah, and and as a as an owner of a business, you have to think about, am I a show horse or am I plow horse? And for your employees, same way, you know, do they do they look good? Do they run fast? Do they give the impression? Or are they in that every day working, 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 uh, little victories every day? And I think that's the difference. And I saw this professionally when I was over in, in UCOM, worked for a guy named Glenn Schaefer, most unassuming two star you'd ever want to meet. I mean, he was, um, you know, when, when we were we were building up for Kosovo, so it's, it was a, a year long planning exercise. Uh, with Wes Clark, the four star, you know, being very demanding. And we would work a lot of Saturdays and Sundays. And I would go up to his office, right? I'd get the task, hey, go figure this thing out. And then I'd go get my team and we go figure it out and I'd go up. And he would be walking around in his office without his shoes on. You know, just, just, he was very unassuming. He was, he always put you at ease. Um, he was authentic. He spoke, right? He encouraged you to speak with courage. Uh, you know, some there were times I disagreed with him, and I was able to tell him I disagreed with him. And there were times when you know he told me to sit down, shut up, and color, and I'd do that too. But it was the relationship we developed. He leaves. He get, moves to a bigger job, right? Moves back to Washington. They bring in a new general officer. Not going to mention his name, but for him, it was all about him. And yeah. suddenly you could see when when there was no back and forth about what needed to be done. So as uh, you know, what I would counsel and I'm so I want to make make sure I get this point across my tip. The thing if I give if if you take away one thing from the any business owner takes away one thing from this session tonight, let it be this one. You, everybody needs a mentor. Everybody needs somebody that can tell them um, their clothes don't look so good, right? That you are have an open and honest relationship with who will give you the brutal truth about your business and you'll listen to them. And I found that the successful leaders have at least one mentor. Many have more. Um, but the point is you need to you need to make sure you have a mentor that you're able to talk about with your business and get honest solid feedback you have to and yeah, uh, yeah and and unfortunately a lot of people don't do that sometimes you know i lean on a couple of guys particularly and i won't name names or something but um it wasn't until i realized i can't do this all on my own where I really started seeing my business take, I won't say leaps and bounds, but bigger steps because I'm able to go and, and run things across and people are able to say, yeah, you're, you're a jackass. Don't do that. Or that's an amazing idea or whatever. But you know, when, when you hang with that circle, that's more successful than you, you should be wanting to get that value of that information. I a hundred percent agree with that, Mark. That's a great point. So I, I, I'll just I, I gotta, I gotta, before we move on. Yeah, you, you've touched on two things that I think are critical. Well, three, one of which I want to give special attention to, and that is 
every one of these students is a student, in my opinion, of Think and Grow Rich, right? Because they're all talking about the mastermind. Now, whether that mastermind group is your Avengers team or it's the RVBA or whatever it is, it's the American Legion, but get in a room full of people more successful than you because you can learn something from anyone. And if you don't think you can learn something from anyone, then <laughs> either you're either on the right hand side of the almighty or we need to be in a room with you. OK, but for the rest of us, you know, the rest of us who are struggling with, you know, how do I read this chart? Give me the compass and binnacle and I'm going to get the position of the sun at the zenith. Right. Whatever. OK, you're talking about level five leadership deference about self-deprecating leaders. Bill Belichick, love him or hate him most successful coach in the history of the National Football League. And I don't care if you love the National Football League or not. He has won 20-something years in a row after Cleveland shit-canned him for being yeah. a loser, right? Yeah. And, yeah, a lot of that had to do with Tom Brady, but a lot more had to do with getting people to buy into his system about not having bitchy millionaires playing the money ball game. Let's have enough money to have talent at every level so we can dominate. So we can go to 13 Super Bowls or 13 AFC championships, nine Super Bowls and six wins. That's level five leadership. And this is a guy who wears, well, you've seen him at his press conferences. He's not dressed in a flashy suit, right? I, I love Bill Parcells. He was a great coach, but he was a, when he got to Dallas, he was a Lee Iacocca. Right. That was a guy who was flashy. I'm the boss. Uh, he blamed the players. He never accepted. He was less humble than when he was the coach of the blue collar New York Giants or yeah. even the Jets, for that matter. And what I'm getting at is Belichick fires himself every end of season, whether they won a Super Bowl or not. He, he gives his uh, I just got fired to Robert Kraft letter. And then he reapplies for the job to make himself go through the mental process of, am I committed to this, mm -hmm. to this goal of winning a championship in New England? And another thing, you know, because I'm a, you know, I'm a sailor. So you're talking about how do you fill up the boat? You know, I mean, I know you were talking little contracts and big contracts, but I'm thinking like, how do you fill up a boat? You know, you can fill it up with one big tuna or a lot of little guys. And either way, you still get to the win. Now, it's a much harder task, to, but on the other hand, you can't count on a 400-pound tuna or a $400,000 contract when you're trying to fill up you know, a sales quota or meet goals and expectations. It's a whole lot easier to count on a whole lot of little 20-pound tunas, right, or whatever the legal limit might be. And, you know, if one slips in under the radar, that's fine. As long as well, you're a Coast Guard guy, you're supposed to know that legal. Yeah. As long as they don't catch it, it's fine. You know, leave it at the bottom of the hold on ice. <laughs> but, but the, you know, those two things really resonate because you're absolutely right. You know, you, you find a formula that works. And if that formula is a, like you were talking about at Raytheon with a, with a business model that is on some more conservative goals but a whole lot more conservative goals. You still got that same energy and effort. You're directing it into something that you know your team can attain, attain, can achieve, and you're committed to doing it as opposed to we've got to go out and land Cisco. We've got to get all the business from IBM. We've got to get all the business from Microsoft. I don't know exactly what you were selling, but I'm just speculating that it had to do with technology, so I'm naming technology companies. That's a big fish to catch. And you've only got four or five targets, right? It's a whole lot easier to get a whole bunch of smaller startups, independents, what have you, people who want to compete with Microsoft, Cisco, what have you. And so I, I think that is a great analogy and something that we can all take away from how to be yeah. a level five leader, but also incorporate in that leadership, that plow horse mentality that I can fill this boat up and feed all my people with the same amount of work and the same dedication with that plow horse mentality, that Bill Belichick mentality, right? Everybody can eat on the New England Patriots. Everybody can get everything they want. They can get all the rings they want because I'm going to help them get everything they want and they're going to help me get everything I want. That's kind of good. Right. I'm going to put a comment up that clearly states exactly what you're saying. Look at this. It says, I think it's more important to remember that a plow horse can become a show horse. That role do not have to be permanent. That's an amazing, amazing comment, Jamie. Thank you for putting that out there because I do agree with 
that because I, I've been in that position. I've had people who work for me in that position. I mean, you have to understand as a leader, you're not always the smartest person in the room. That's why you have a team below you. And right. I 100% agree with that. Well, I think, you know, like a good homework assignment is always um, to stay humble is right. What if the press would write something about you, about your company, what would they write? What would uh -oh. they write about you and what would they write about a company? Man, if they and don't write anything good role. if they, I hope they lie. Well, I mean, the point being, if you don't know how they would do that, I think you should, you know, reflect on that point. And if it's about you more, I mean, if they, if they would write about you as the company, that's, that's also, um, you know, while for a very small company, single, you know, single owner company, single employee company, it might work. But as you start to, to bring in more employees, right there, they want, they want to make sure you, you, they want to be part of that enterprise. They want to be, they want to feel pride in what they're doing. Go back to where I started, right? That yeah, a lot of absolutely. workers simply don't feel as though they get the the proper recognition. They don't have any understanding of what the company's really about. And that's a, that's a pretty that. systemic problem. I'm going to do that. I'm going to sit down and I'm going to, I'm going to put some thought into that because I am a, I'm a small, small business. I'm a me yeah. plus one or two helpers. So, you know, I am the plow horse and the show horse, you know, and, and I was going to ask you that. What if you're both? So I, I think we can feed that into the, the coming, you know, topics and things like that. But I, I, well, here, here's here's one thing that I think is critical that we all and I noticed that all of us learn this from the service and whether you're a patriot or not. The uniform. And when you step out the door, whether it doesn't matter what your uniform is, look sharp, right? If your uniform is, I'm about to get up in an attic and make, I'm going to rock somebody's AV world. <laughs> you can't come in there looking like, you know, you just got off the mid watch and you're covered in, you know. You better show up looking pretty, but, but yeah, you, you, can't be, you can't, you can't have powdered donut crumbles on your uniform. When you show up, look, you just can't look sloppy, right? Make sure if you've got, you know, a civil war reenactor beard, like Jeff Skitter, it's trimmed. It's neat. You know, you got a good clean ball cap on, you got a clean shirt on. You look, you're wearing whatever the uniform is. Look good. And you, well, don't it, need a to, your, to your point, your brand, right? You wear your brand. Absolutely. Cause you're representing your, you know, it's like when we go to a Legion event, right? We're, we're going to put on as many of us as possible. We're all wearing some sort of Legion uniform because we want to present the best image possible for that event, whether it, it doesn't matter what it is. And same thing when docs, docs people show up because they've come to my house to roof. They've come to my house in, in the middle of a flood. They've come to my house when our neighbor accidentally knocked down our fence and you know, they, those people, they, they look sharp and they are, Jeff, I don't want to hear it. No, but they, they are wearing a good, clean uniform. There are people you would welcome into your home. You're not like, who is this skeezy looking? Did he just come out of the Hunt County jail? That's not an image you can project. Well, that's, that's sort of show horsemen, right? And that's the well. Yeah. You guys are. Let's see. You're. You're. I'm talking to three exceptions, because the fact that you're doing this, you you take time and energy within the chamber to share your uh, experiences and bring others in to share their experiences. So you make the collective group, everybody who's watching a little bit smarter. I mean, that's really um, admirable in terms of, and it, and it speaks to your characters as individuals. And so you just need to make sure that character carries over to your business, yeah. right? And I, and I wanna, I know we're getting to the end of the hour here, but I, you know, the other point, and I think this is an important point, about building that team is the mirror and the window, the analogy he uses in the book, that the good leaders look in the mirror to assign blame. They look out the window to assign credit, right? It's, it's 
I look out the window to my, you know, I give credit to, to those that participated. Doc, Doc gets a new roof on, you know, puts a really outstanding roof on a house. It's all about his team that did that, not him. Without question. Yeah. Something gets broken or something's not done proper on the roof. He looks in the mirror and that's now my responsibility, not those of the workers. It, it's spot on. I, I, I like that. That is really. I can tell you right now, I think I've took and taken, excuse me, more notes on, on this right here than I've done on any of these because I feel like you're, you're speaking directly to the people that we're trying to help. The, the whole reason why we do this in the RBBA, we, we give up our Thursdays plus the, the time to build this you know program or whatever. And we appreciate, you know, the kudos, but honestly, we're not doing this for us. And we've, we've said that practically on every yeah, one. Yeah, I know. Yeah. And that's, I mean, and I know you're not. And that's, yeah. that's why I just, I want to make sure you get a little bit of no, we appreciate pat on the back it. about it. Yeah. But okay. it also reinforces for your listeners the very point, you know, you talk about what's it take to build level five leader. And there's, you know, there's a chart in there that explains it. Yeah. But at the end of the day, I'm looking at, at three that I think are well on that journey. That's awesome. That's, That's very cool. humbling. Thank you. Appreciate that, Mark. Um, if I could just give you guys one of the biggest takeaways that, that I've gotten from this is when I want to create success, I want the people on the team to be more successful than I am. Well, yeah. Right. And the reason behind that is because once they become more successful than I am, the trickle down effect is almost tenfold. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? And that's when I, when I, when I've listened over this, like I promise you guys, I love to talk and this is probably the, one of the few RVBA videos. No so true. I have kept my mouth relatively quiet because I wanted to listen. I wanted to hear, what what the expert has to say what the person who studied um about being a leader who's been a leader who's 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 delegated and, and been effective at doing it you know what i mean yeah we believe that's what creates success is i became very very humble today and said i'm just going to shut my freaking trap and open my ears and try to absorb as much knowledge as i can within one hour um so thank you, Mark, for taking time out. We know you got a busy, busy plate on your hands. We know there's a lot of things going on in everybody's lives, but especially we want to appreciate you coming out today, sharing one hour of your time with us and just dropping massive knowledge bombs. On I think this may be the most valuable in, in terms of education that we've had to date. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. I yeah, really appreciate it. Sir. All right. Thank you. So and uh, it's and as a as a fellow veteran, anything we do to lift up our fellow veterans is a good day. No even, doubt, even if they're Coast Guard. Heck yeah, and if we're at it, even if they're Coast Guard. I, I love the Coast Guards, guys, especially when there's when there's a lot of water coming into the boat. Yeah, no yeah. doubt, no doubt. Especially when the Marines get to, they, they need to be dropped off in the right place because they get lost. That's, that's, that's the Navy. Yeah. <laughs> hey, you know what, man? Without without uh, you guys here to help plan this whole thing, without Mark being on tonight, I just got to say thank you. You know, I, I'm, this is a humbling one for me, too, and it makes me want to just give some kudos to Casey and Doc. You know, this whole thing really started by just a, a, a thought, and we were doing a book talk one day, and we said, let's do it every single day, and it's 23, 24 weeks later. Man, you guys mean the world to me. I appreciate you guys. I couldn't do this without you guys. You know, the Rockwell Veterans Business Alliance is veterans, but it's also patriots. We have a significant presence in the Rockwall County area. Um, I just got a couple of messages on my phone during this. Hey, I'm new to fate. I'm a vet. But hey, come join us, guys. If you're a veteran, if you're a patriot, we want to bring in everybody that we can because what we're trying to do is we're trying to dominate this area to be the most impactful and valuable organization in the community to help everyone around us. So thank you guys so much for everything you do. Well, and, I, and, and don't, and there, and being part of the RDBA is being part of a bigger team of the chamber. Absolutely. So 
uh, and the the Rockwall area chamber has a an incredible depth of talent and businesses. So guaranteed, any question any business owner has about something, it can be answered through that chamber. Without question, really, completely, a thousand percent agree. I have, uh, you know, seen other chambers, lived in other towns, chambers ten times as big. Don't give the value that this one does, and this organization within it that uh, was literally the brainchild of a couple of veterans a few years ago, and and how meaningful it has been. It's been an honor to be part of it and and watch it grow into this, and especially since. You know, really, it, it is exactly what all three of you have said is that we're all trying to lift everyone up. You know, yeah. we're, that, you know, we're in competition with who we were yesterday. Right. The, the Patriot and business veteran businesses that we were yesterday. That's your competition every day, every day. Man, I appreciate y'all boys. Y'all have a good night. Thank you again, Mark, for coming on and joining with us. It's Friday tomorrow. Go kill it, boys. Y'all have a good evening. All right. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Later.